I'm not the first person to add nerd to the end of something, you know, video game nerd or whatever it is. Um, but I, I put the plural on it on purpose because I think you probably should be a knife steel nerd to come to my website. Otherwise, you'll be bored. And, you know, sometimes I share links on Facebook or something and someone says, ah, I didn't I didn't find this interesting at all or I don't care about the steel. Just let me buy the knife. I don't care. And uh, that's fine. If, if you don't care, you don't you don't have to read about it. But for us nerds, I write for you. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from theknifejunkie.com. And tonight we have a very great show coming up. We have an interview with Laren Thomas, who is a knife steel nerd. And we'll leave it there and we'll get to it in a minute. And it's going to be a lucky show, too, Bob. This is episode number 13, but it's going to be lucky because we've got Laren with us. And I'm excited to learn about this metallurgy, knife steel, and all that. But first, I want to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash knifejunkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, or your MP3 player. Again, go to www.audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. So without any further ado, Bob, let's get right into it. Well, today I'm speaking with Laren Thomas. By day, Laren develops steel for the automotive industry, and by night, he's a knife steel nerd. His website, knifesteelnerds.com, is a serious and scholarly exploration of knife steels and their attributes and properties. It's full of graphs, charts, and data. And if I owned a knife manufacturing company, I'd memorize this material and have Laren on speed dial. After all, the man has a PhD in metallurgical and materials engineering, and it's my honor to have him on the podcast. Laren, welcome. Oh, thanks. What a great intro. Did you write that yourself? <laughs> I did indeed. And and uh, I'm out for hire too. So if you know anyone else, you know, let me know. Okay. So uh, when we start this podcast, we always like to ask what you're carrying in your pocket. We're all knife enthusiasts. And uh, so what do you have, Laren? What are you carrying? Uh, I have a Spyderco small Persian, which I'm holding up mm. to the camera so that everyone listening can see it. <laughs> and so this knife was designed by Ed Shemp. He's a custom knife maker, and uh, he's one of the early knife makers that I met at knife shows that I went to with my dad. And uh, I like this knife. Uh, I have higher end, more expensive knives, and sometimes I don't carry them because I'm worried about losing them or mm -hmm. breaking them. Uh, and so, but this knife is a good balance of of cost and uh, performance. It's relatively thin, and I don't carry really large knives. Um, just based on what I use knives for, you know, the most dangerous thing I encounter with a knife is usually uh, a box with mm -hmm. tape on it. So I prefer something smaller and lightweight and, uh, I'm not, I don't have really big hands anyway. So yeah, that's probably enough about the, uh, small Persian from Spyderco. It also has Rockwell indents on it because I always test the hardness of all my knives, even though it affects mm -hmm. them cosmetically. But I have no memory of what hardness I actually measured with it. So, <laughs> well, the uh, the Persian is an awesome knife. I have the larger version. It doesn't have the bolsters uh, that yours mm -hmm. has. It's just the straight G10. My brother got it for me for my 42nd birthday, and uh, it's a knife I will never part with for that reason. But aside from that, I love how thin and sharp and sweet it is. It's so thin behind the edge, just kind of looks at whatever it's cutting, and and it yawns the material open. Uh, today I'm, uh, today I've got a, an Emerson Sachs on me. Uh, this is the new Emerson that came out, uh, in 2018, at least the new one that I liked. I hadn't bought a new Emerson since 2013. Um, I put a new clip on it from MXG gear and this has the, uh, 154 CM, which I want to talk to you later about. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm also carrying, uh, the GEC 38. Uh, in high carbon, I guess it's 1095 steel. And it's got this beautiful Mexican bocote wood. I like this for food mostly. Pulling it out and cutting my lunch and then seeing if I can get a nice patina on it. Yeah. I, yeah. I visited Great Eastern Cutlery. It was there in uh, Pennsylvania. I don't remember where. Kind of Bradford, in the middle of nowhere. Or, or is that case? I, 
I don't remember which city it was. <laughs> um, so I went there with my dad. It, it was very impressive. Uh, almost everything was done by hand, it seemed like. Um, you know, based on the price, I figured most of it was done by machines. But mm -hmm. I mean, especially all of the fitting is done by hand, all of the finished grinding. So, I mean, I was pretty impressed with how much work is done by hand for the cost of the knives. So it, wow. I was ready to buy one after touring the factory. <laughs> so. I've also heard that the machines they work on are very old, too. Uh, I'm not sure if that's just mythology, you know, part of the myth or or if it's. Yeah, there was definitely some some older equipment there. I don't remember exactly now. It's been at least a year, I think. But uh, mm. yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of that type of equipment, you know, they don't make it every day. So it's pretty specialized. So right. it's probably right. easier to get used equipment. So, Jim, what are you carrying today? Well, let's uh, not forget your third knife, which I'm assuming you have. It's oh, always yeah. your pink cold steel broken skull. So I'm assuming yeah. that got that one as well. That's a standard that Bob carries. So pink broken skull. So I, I didn't think you were going to fool me on that one. But anyway, folks know that I uh, I have my little buck canoe, uh, which I picked up in uh, episode six when Bob uh, made me choose a knife from his collection that uh, I'm hoping I get to keep. So we'll just kind of keep that between me and you. Let's not tell Bob about that. I, I may have fallen out of love, Jim, so maybe, okay. maybe she's all yours. Okay, sounds good. So, Laren, uh, give us some background. How did you become so fascinated with steel, and how did you get to this point? Yeah, I think it's impossible to talk about my interest in knives and steel without talking about my dad. So my dad's name is Devin Thomas, and he's known for making Damascus and kitchen knives and other things. So he started making knives when he was very young, maybe 12 or 13. And so by the time I was born, he was already well into it. And for as long as I can remember, that was the sole source of income for our family was my dad's business. Uh, so we kind of lived and breathed it. You know, dad went to work and he made Damascus and he made knives. And uh, he always told us that he was world famous. Mm -hmm. And so I would tell my friends like, oh, my dad's famous. They're like, oh, who is he? I said, Devin Thomas. Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my mom also told me that my dad was the strongest dad in the whole world, so maybe they were full of lies, my parents. I think both of those things were true, actually. Right, right. <laughs> Just depending on who you ask. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I was I was semi-interested in knives. You know, I, I wanted one. My dad always had them, so, you know, by the time I was 10 or so, I saw my, my uncles that were only a few years older than me. They had pocket knives, and I really wanted one, but I wouldn't say that I was more interested in knives than I was in anything else. You know, I wanted knives, but I also wanted uh, a Game Boy, you know, so. Right. So I, I wouldn't say that knives were an obsession at that point. But mm -hmm. when I was a teenager, my dad took me to a couple knife shows. I remember a Vegas show that I went to early on and then the Blade show a few months later. And uh, what really interested me there was the steel. Um, they think a lot of things about knives are kind of intuitive, you know, like you can show someone a knife and you say, okay, this is the handle and, uh, you know, here's a sharp edge on here. I don't mean on the, on the blade itself. I mean, on the handle. So that's not very comfortable. <laughs> you know, you can say this, this edge is thinner than that one. So it cuts better. You know, all of that kind of makes sense. Uh, and my dad would tell me about these things. I'm like, okay, this is all, all, you know, making sense. Uh, but the steel and the heat treatment was really difficult to wrap my head around. I remember the knife makers, you know, saying, oh, I, I use this special heat treatment process. It takes me four days and uh, I make the best knives in the whole <laughs> world. You know, it's indestructible. It cuts forever. You know, whatever right. they said, or I have this special proprietary steel. No one else has it. And it makes my my fillet knives bend 90 degrees and they'll never break kind of thing. <laughs> And uh, so with other areas of knives, they make sense. But with steel, say, OK, what's a good steel? They say 154 cm. And what's a bad steel? 440A. Like, OK, what, you're just saying random numbers and letters. What does any of that mean? Exactly. And, you know, what makes a good heat treatment? Well, it's got to be 61 Rockwell C. And uh, OK, you know what? And what is that? Oh, this steel's tougher than that one, and this steel's more wear resistant than that one. Though so it's a whole field of engineering on its own, just steel and heat treatment. And so I wanted to learn everything I could, and I dove in head first and you know 
you know, in my teens, I became very interested in steel and was reading everything I could. So initially, did you feel like you were being hoodwinked by the knife makers? Like these guys are all just selling snake oil, steel is steel. And then you looked into it and saw, you know, and, and saw that it was a more complex topic or, or was it watching your dad, uh, you know, labor with the Damascus? Uh, I mean, the Damascus was interesting, but I think what interested me was the knife makers. And mm -hmm. I think it's more complicated than just snake oil or real. Uh, they're doing a good job. Usually custom knife makers, some of them dry harder than others. Well, OK, so let's let's get on to knife steel nerds. I want to find out uh, what, what your mission is with knife steel nerds and uh, where you want to see it, how you want to see it grow. And and I sensed from it that that you want to build a community out of it. Hence the the pluralization of the uh, you know of the name. Yeah, is that yeah. Right? You called me a knife steel nerd, and that is correct. Um, you know, I'm not the first person to add nerd to the end of something. You know, video mm -hmm. game nerd or whatever it is. Right. Um, but I I put the plural on it on purpose because I think you probably should be a knife steel nerd to come to my website. Otherwise, you'll be bored. And you know, sometimes I share links on Facebook or something, and someone says ah, I didn't. I didn't find this interesting at all, or I don't care about the steel. Just let me buy the knife. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's fine. If, if you don't care, you don't, you don't have to read about it. But for us nerds, I write for you. So when did, uh, when did knife steel, you know, from your perspective, uh, become such a deciding factor for um, people purchasing knives on the open market, you know, uh, production knives and such? Oh, that's a good question. It seems like when I first started collecting, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It seems like when I first started collecting knives, like in the late eighties or so, it was just, you liked the knife, you bought it. If I could get my hands on a cold steel Tanto back then, I don't care what it's made out of. And then somewhere along the line, um, I started sensing steel nerd, uh, steel snobs is what I called them. Like, I won't, I won't use that knife unless it has a certain level of steel. And then I discovered one day, you know, that's me now. So mm -hmm. what's that all about? Yeah, I have a couple articles on my website that cover some of that history. Uh, I have an article on carbon versus stainless that gets into it some, and uh, an article on the history of 154CM. Uh, uh, two big changes were Damascus steel and 154CM. And when I say Damascus, I mean pattern welded steel. Of course, mm -hmm. Bill Moran famously uh, introduced Damascus steel, or reintroduced it anyway, into the American custom uh, knife market. And so he would promote Damascus steel as being the best thing ever. You couldn't grind it with any belts. It would just dull them immediately. It would cut forever. You couldn't break it. Just Damascus was this mythical material from days gone by, you know, legendary material that could do anything. Then around the same time period, uh, Bob Loveless introduced 154 CM. And of course, the steel already existed, but he he popularized it and it really introduced it to custom knives. And uh, he said, you know, this steel was made for turbine engines in the most modern jet airplanes and it'll cut forever. And, you know, no novice knife maker should start with 154 CM. But <laughs> for the experienced knife maker, you can get a lot out of the steel. And I think things kind of slowly evolve from there. You know, more steel's coming out and until we get to today. So 154 CM was a, I was going to ask you about it because um because Emerson Knife Company they they make knives that are selling for the same cost of knives that have much higher end steel than 154 higher end meaning more expensive you know I just bought a ZT for the same exact price and it had 20 CV which is an alphanumeric combination that I am told is of greater value than 154 CM so that's what I was curious about I love 154 CM it seems to sharpen uh, really easily. And, uh, you know, I, to be honest, I don't really do much with my knives. It's all soft core work. So for me, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a status -y thing. I hate to put it that way, but not status, but certain, certain knives are only coming now with certain steels. And if you like a certain designer, you're going to have to start spending a little bit more money. That's what, that's what I've noticed anyway. Um, so what kind of testing do you do at Knife Steel Nerds? Uh, we've done a few different things. We've done some independent toughness testing, and that's allowed us to do a couple fun things. So I did a study with my dad on a crucible forging steel called Crew Forge V, and he tried different forging temperatures and hardening temperatures, tempering temperatures. 
And then we measured the toughness to find, you know, what's the best combination for highest toughness. I uh, did a similar study with a knife maker named Warren Crico on Z-Wear, is also known as CPM crew wear. And we can, there, there's two different types of tempering. You can do a low temperature temper around 400 degrees Fahrenheit or a high temperature temper around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Both result in a similar hardness. And so there's kind of a, a question among lots of knife makers, which one's tougher or better. So we compared those two to each other. Uh, I bought a knife edge impact tester which uh, I'm going to try to correlate the toughness testing we do on the material itself with the toughness of the final knives. And that allows us to compare different sharpening methods and edge geometries. And wow, that's incredible. Let me ask you, what is the problem with testing toughness? What is the problem with testing toughness? Well, The, uh, the, re the reason I ask you that is it, it from your website, it seemed like you saw an opening. You saw like th this is something that is not getting tested universally. Um, so maybe you should come up with a method of doing so. Oh, sure. So uh, you can look up toughness for some steels. So if you type in uh, S90V data sheet from Crucible, it'll come up and it'll say that it gets 19 foot pounds at 58 Rockwell, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you type in M390 data sheet from Udahome, it'll come up and you'll look and look through and you'll see a bullet point that says good toughness. <laughs> and then you'll look through some more and you won't find anything else. No numbers, no anything. Mm -hmm. uh, then you might find another Udahome data sheet from Venetus 4 Extra, and it does have toughness numbers on there. So you say, great, now I'll compare my Venetus 4 Extra toughness to my S90V toughness. But the numbers don't line up because they use two different tests. Mm -hmm. So some steels don't have any testing at all. Um, the different companies use different types of tests, and so you can't compare anything between different companies. Uh, and sometimes they even throw you a loop, like S30V data sheet, has a transverse toughness number where the other data sheets have a longitudinal toughness number and you can't even compare crucible to itself transverse meaning across the through through the blade versus so uh it's not a blade it's a rectangular specimen oh okay. uh, generic toughness specimen and it's transverse to the rolling direction so when they make steel they they hot roll it okay. and um, because it's elongated all in one direction the properties are directional so they behave differently along the rolling direction than they do transverse to it. <laughs> so you, you can measure toughness in different directions. Right. I got you. Are those discrepancies, do you think, going to lead to some type of knife standards, industry standards, or is every manufacturer just going to kind of have their own data sheet and specs, that kind of thing? Uh, I think in some ways the knife companies benefit from the information not being available. So I, I doubt the knife companies themselves have come up with any standard. Uh, I've come up with one testing method that I want to keep using so that everything can be compared to each other. So uh, I, I'm fighting for you, the consumer. But I mean, a lot of these uh, heavy use knives, for example, they'll use 20 CV or M390 or something. And that is not a high toughness steel. Uh, so they don't want there to be any toughness numbers for that steel because it'll make people not want to buy it. So that's why you don't see camp knives made with that kind of steel, right? You just pocket knives that maintain sharpness, but that don't get much tough use, even if it's a hard use knife. Yeah, that is one reason. The other is cost, both in material and in finishing. So a camp knife is much bigger than a pocket knife. So it is much more expensive to finish. And because right. it's a high wear resistant steel, they don't want to have to finish that big a knife. And when you're talking a pocket knife, the steel is pretty cheap. But when it's a big old camp knife, then the steel becomes a much more significant portion of the cost. Right. So you work in the uh, creating metals for the automotive industry. Is that correct? Yes. So steel is your work all day long. Not uh -huh. just steel, but but the internals of steel, you know, the, the philosophy of steel or whatever you want to say. So what is it about knife steel in particular that uh, makes you want to start digging into steel again when you come home after a day's work? Is it its connection with knives or do the steels themselves have a beauty or property that uh, is attractive to you as a steel, as a metallurgist? Yeah, well, my original interest was in knife steels. That's why I went to school to become a metallurgist, because I really like knife steels. Uh, not long after I started going to school for metallurgy, Crucible went bankrupt. And uh, that was very disappointing because I love Crucible. They were coming out with all the coolest steels. You know, S30V was still pretty new at the time. And that was awesome that they made a steel just for knives. And I was like, wow, I really want to go and develop knife steels at Crucible. 
the Crucible went bankrupt. They now still exist, but the research center that used to be in the Pittsburgh area is now owned by a different company. And uh, the way they used to research deals is now completely different, and all of that old staff is gone. And then I went to grad school, and I started my thesis on automotive steel. And uh, automotive steel is also pretty cool. It's completely different than knife steel. Uh, There's a lot more development going on in automotive steel because of uh, all of the competition with aluminum and safety standards, gas mileage, and, and all of that is really pushing the car manufacturers to more advanced steels. And so we're struggling to keep up designing new steels for them. And so they're really cool. But knife steel is almost a completely different material. I might as well be working on titanium or plastic for all the similarities there are sometimes, it seems like. Is the automotive industry looking for lighter steel? Is that, is that what you mean? Like, uh, Usually what we do is we make stronger steel so that they can, they can down gauge the material, which then, of course, makes it lighter. Now, th- right. the problem is that stronger you make the steel, the less ductility it has. So they're trying to form complex shapes in it, and the strong steel will split or crack instead of forming into the part. So they don't want it to just be stronger. It's got to have the same degree of ductility or formability as the current material while also being stronger. And uh, to make it stronger, one easy way is to add carbon. But the one thing that they don't want is more carbon in the steel because that makes it harder to weld. So we have uh, all these competing goals for designing the steel, and it's it's, uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, So for a while, I was really focused on automotive steel, especially in grad school. And uh, knife steel had kind of taken a back seat. And, you know, I'd I'd basically resigned to the fact that I'd be working for a company designing automotive steel since that's where all the development is. Uh, But I started working and designing steels and I really enjoy my job. But I started realizing, you know, why why don't I do something with knife steel? Nothing's stopping me. I can go write about it. I can buy a furnace and do some experiments at my house. You know, I can do whatever I want and I can enjoy knife steel again. And it doesn't matter that my job is in automotive steel. So let's just do it. And so I started the website and started writing. So is the creation of your own knife steel something you can do? Is that, is that possible to do in your basement? Yes and no. So, uh, I am working on a knife steel. It's still a super top secret which is why I'm saying it on the podcast right now. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't written about it at all on the website because you know, we're not ready for announcements. Right, um, right. But I'm working with a, a knife steel supply company called Alpha Knife Supply. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we, we ordered a 50-pound heat of a composition that I designed from a company that specializes in laboratory-sized heats of steel. And uh, we've been characterizing it ever since. So the the goal is to make a very balanced stainless steel. So uh, right now there are two major types of stainlesses that you can buy. Well, there's more than that. But in high-end knives, there's ABL, which has a really high toughness and really poor wear resistance. It's very similar to a carbon steel in that way. Easy to sharpen, uh, very tough, uh, not very wear resistant. And then there's a whole category of powder metallurgy stainless steels, stuff like S30V, M390, 20CV, S90V, all of those. They're all high wear resistant stainless steels with relatively poor toughness, even though they're powder metallurgy steels. And so there's kind of a big hole in between those two Hmm. uh, that uh, I would like to fill. We'll see if we're successful. That sounds amazing. Uh, I'm fascinated by the concept. I do a lot of basement kind of projects. You know, I, I build knives, um, in my spare time, uh, self taught, you know, and YouTube taught. And I've just recently been using AEBL and I made an outdoor knife for a friend of mine, not having any idea whether I was thinking it was going to be brittle because it was stainless and I, I hadn't done any research. So it's interesting to hear that I actually blundered into the right kind of stainless steel for what I was making this, this knife for. But what I was getting to is, I, I you know, I, I have a lot of, basement projects and the thought of going into the basement and, and uh, you know, the proverbial basement and whipping up my own batch of super steel. It's amazing to me. That's so cool. Yeah, it's been really fun. I was just going to say as the knife newbie, you know, all these uh, acronyms, these letters and these numbers, you know, it's like, woof, you know, over my head and, and looking at your blog, 
the articles are so in depth. You know, you've got charts and graphics and, you know, big explanations. I mean, you really get into explaining all this. I, you know, I just had a curiosity question. How long does it take for you to, to prepare an article? Because it's not like, you know, you were talking about testing the steel, you know, a little bit earlier. It's not like that's, you know, a half hour process where you just go out in the backyard. So, I mean, this is a pretty involved process that you're in time commitment that you're making to the Knife Steel Nerds blog. Uh, yeah, it's very time consuming. It's hard to get an average amount of time. I spend at least several hours on any article, you know, even the ones where I think, OK, I'm going to write on tempering of steel. This is easy. I know all about tempering. But then, you know, I start going through my articles and make sure, making sure I have all my I's dotted and T's crossed. And then before I know it, I've spent three hours just on collecting my articles and making sure I understand everything. And so, yeah, usually I spend several hours gathering research, you know, journal articles and books and things and reading through them and making sure I, I have everything square and ready to go. And then there are several hours reading it and picking what sources I'm going to cite. And then it takes me two or three hours to write it. And then I got to edit it several times. And so, yeah, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've got an audience that uh, that understands and knows this, too. It's not like some generic knife site where you can just kind of, you know, wing it or throw stuff out. You probably have a lot of fact checkers and people that really understand the, the knife steals that are going to. Make, you know, make some comments or call you out if you get it wrong. So there's a lot of research time that goes into it. Oh, yeah. Every, every time I'm wrong, I hear about it. Oh. Hey, uh, how do you feel about anecdotal testing? There's uh, do you, Are you familiar with uh, Cedric and Ada Outdoors channel on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen yeah. It okay. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's this Australian uh, gentleman. He's a knife enthusiast and he does these... Uh, what he would characterize as thir thoroughly unscientific. He calls it bro science, where basically he he has a um, a system for testing knife steels, where he cuts through sisal rope, uh, the same half inch sisal rope each time, and then and then tests the sharpness on paper, and and he counts the cuts, and you know the harder the steel, the more the cuts, and uh, I think I think for him he he needed to know that he was spending his money on steel that was actually doing what it was purported to, to be capable of. And uh, so he started doing this anecdotal testing and it's actually quite entertaining. And, and for the, the bro out there, it's a, it, it is a good way to sort of gauge whether uh, you actually need that knife steel. So do you think people who don't use their knives hard or, or, I, for instance, have a, a pretty nice knife collection and I have never taken any one of those knives close to failure. You know, maybe I've, I've dulled some VG10 and, and, and such, but, uh, for those of us who don't hard use our knife, are we wasting our money by, by buying a ZT with 20 CV for 240 bucks, even though I'm never going to push it to 20 CV levels of edge retention? Okay. You've asked, you've asked a lot of big questions and <laughs> I'm going to try to get to them all. So, uh, number one, what do I think about YouTube, uh, bro science? So, uh, there, there, I'm of two minds about it. Oh, so, I, I don't dislike it. So, I watch some of Pete's videos and, and they're fun. Um, there's, there's one, one problem that happens sometimes in these videos, and that's that they compare two different knives. Uh, they're very different, they have completely different edge geometries maybe at two different hardnesses. And uh, so, so then they'll sharpen them to a similar angle to try to reduce some variables. And then they cut through a bunch of rope and they say the one in VG10 cut longer than the one in S30V. So why are we spending extra money on S30V? Uh, but you didn't compare VG10 to S30V. You compared two different knives to each other. And edge geometry is more important than steel. And uh, it, it's popular to say that that heat treatment is more important than steel. I think that's mm -hmm. a little bit overblown, but edge geometry is much more important than steel. So if you want a knife to cut a long time on rope, then you should have a knife that's designed for cutting a lot of rope. <laughs> yeah. And so well, that's one thing I don't like is when you're testing 10 variables that are different against each other and then picking out one of those and saying, VG10 is better than S30V. So that's what I don't like about some some YouTube videos. I won't say that that's what happens on the Citric and Ada channel. I'm just talking mm -hmm. broadly about 
something that happens sometimes that that I don't agree with. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when when people say this isn't scientific or this isn't real science, uh, sometimes I disagree with that. You know, the only thing that makes it science is that you're you're testing things and trying things. And uh, the more you're able to limit your variables and focus on one thing at a time, the more you're going to learn uh, without coming to false conclusions based on all the other things that happened that you didn't account for. Sometimes you see in, in a YouTube channel the evolution of this. You know, some mm -hmm. early videos, you're like, oh, you didn't pay attention to that or that or this or this. And then uh, after they've been on for a couple of years, then then they're like, oh, well, I need to account for this edge geometry. So I ground down this knife a little thinner. Uh, and then I did this to this one. And you're like, wow, they really learned a lot in a couple of years. Um, but sometimes there's some rough start. A couple of helpful comments from Laren Thomas might help things to uh, to go quicker for those guys. One other quick question here. What is your favorite steel? Uh, just let's just say for a pocket knife that you carry. I know you, you're, you're carrying a Persian. That's VG10, I think. But mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. do you have a favorite steel or, or is it just a favorite edge geometry? Uh, my favorite steel is probably AEBL, um, because I like a steel that is easy to sharpen and can take very fine edges. Uh, so you asked earlier, you know, what, should we spend all this money on knives if we're not going to take it to the limit? Uh, toughness becomes very important when you're trying to make a thin knife. So I like a knife with a thin edge, or if it's not particularly thin, then I, I sharpen it to a, a shallow angle. Uh, so that it cuts better, because that's the main thing I do with my knives is cut things. Uh, if I'm going to pry something, then I pick another stupid tool to try to <laughs> pry things like screwdrivers that I shouldn't use either. <laughs> so but I want them very thin and to be very thin, they have to be hard and they have to be tough. And um, you'll learn real quick that steel can fail if you're trying to have thin knives. And I think there are a lot of people with folders that don't get used very much or for very rough things and that's fine and uh, for that reason uh, I really like kitchen knives because if there's one type of knife that does get used all the time uh, by your mom by your grandma by your brother uh, I mean. by your sister yeah by you everyone uses kitchen knives and so if you really want to learn how knives cut what makes a knife better than another why thin is better um, you know why you want a hard tough steel and a thin edge uh, why you care about sharpening, you learn real fast with a knife's chef's knife. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want any sharp edges on that thing to cut up your hand while you're trying to cut up peppers. And uh, so you learn a lot about cutting and you really gain an appreciation for the performance of different knives and steel and heat treatments um, in the kitchen. Chef's knives. That makes so much sense. That's just in that makes intuitive sense. Even I understood that one. <laughs> So in, in closing, what, what in, from your perspective, what is the future of knife steel? How much harder, tougher, and corrosion resistant can we get with our steels? Yeah, that's a good question. I've heard rumors about some new steels coming from here or there. I haven't uh, learned that many solid things. There are new steels that come out occasionally. Uh, you know, I wrote an article about nitrogen alloyed steels. A lot of people were, are excited about those that are coming out. Um, so Vanax is a really interesting mm -hmm. steel. Uh, it's very highly corrosion resistant while having similar properties to some of the other popular powder metallurgy stainless steels. So the thing that frustrates me is just this uh, kind of pattern that we're in right now. Where, like I said, they keep making new S30V steels. You know, like, oh, I, I made S30V version 2, and <laughs> this, this one's 10% better than S30V, um, without coming out with, with new categories. You know, so in, in carbon steels and tool steels, you can get almost any combination of properties you want. You know, this one you can forge, this one's super tough, this one's super wear resistant, and everything in between. But in stainless steels, it seems like they're locked in on this S30V, M390 category, and they're, you're all just comparing tiny deviations from one another. Mm. So you know, people ask, what's the toughest stainless steel? And some people say, oh, it's LMAX or S30V or whatever, and it's none of those. But that's that's what's available and what everyone's arguing between. But, you know, they're arguing between the F-150 and the Dodge Ram, you know, and acting like they're completely different from each other, where it seems like in tool steels, um, nobody's pushing 10V like like it's going to be the toughest steel ever. But 10V is just like all those stainless steels, only the tool steel version. Oh, oh all right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting too uh, 
too jargony. So I, I, I added in the numbers and the letters again. <laughs> So. And the eyes glazed over. Yeah. That's that's fine. That's fine. You are the knife steel nerd after all. <laughs> well, and, and that is a problem with the website. So I, I get a lot of good compliments from people that said, oh, this is great. I learned so many things and this is awesome. And I get comments from other people that said this was just a little too too above my level. And uh, that that's frustrating to hear. And some people also want to compliment me like, wow, this was so advanced. I'll never understand it. Um, and that's the worst compliment for me to get. <laughs> Because I, I really do want to make things possible to be understood on the website. Yeah. And and the frustrating thing is I want to go way in deep and say like, okay, I'm going to blow your mind with all this information on what makes a steel tougher than another. But to do that, I can't spend 10 pages on what toughness is first. Right. And and so I, I'm trying to do some more backfilling. You know, after I get out the really advanced stuff out of my system, then I can go back in and write some more intro articles. Uh, but really, I'm going backwards where I should have started with really basic things and then built up, but I'm too impatient. You can start on your glossary of terms, do that on the side, but uh, everyone should be grateful that KnifeSteelNerds.com exists just because you want to know that if if you want to go deep, deep, deep into steel, that there's a place to do that. And it seems like that's the place to do that. Right. Uh, Laren, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Jim, did you want to say something? I was just going to give Laren a chance to to plug the website a little bit more and talk about his Patreon group. Oh, sure. Yeah, so definitely go to my website. If you don't understand something, every article has links to other articles, which will make even less sense than the article you're currently reading. Uh, send me emails. I'll answer your questions. I spend too much time answering questions, and I'll answer some more. You just send me an email, and I'll explain anything you want. So just... Ask me what 154 cm is, and then I'll say, "Did you already read my article on 154 cm? It's 12 pages long." And the uh, the Patreon, I accept donations. So uh, Knife Steel Nerds was never intended to make money. I did not want another job when I started Knife Steel Nerds. This was supposed to be my fun hobby. Knife Steel, completely different than Car Steel, uh, e even if other people think it's the same. And I really wanted to separate them, but I did get a couple people that offered me money. And so I started to think, well, what would I do if I had some money? And what I would do would buy equipment and pay for testing and do more fun things to support the website. Because uh, there is a lot of scientific literature out there explaining a lot of cool steel things, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. So uh, if you want to give money to the Patreon, I give free mugs to anyone that gives a certain amount. And uh, all of that money goes to testing for the website. Well, Laren, again, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. You're a trove of information. And uh, even though I might not uh, be able to understand all of the graphs and data that I see on your website and in your articles, I definitely can understand the words you write there. Uh, it, it is accessible in that way. So I think everyone should be grateful that you're there. You are a resource to be tapped. Uh, if people really want to know what's up with their knife steals that they're spending all this money on, like I do, uh, reach out to Laren. Go to the KnifeSteelNerds.com website and check it out. Thanks to Laren for being with us on the podcast, a wealth of uh, knowledge that we have just only begun to tap. And uh, maybe we can have you back on another time, Laren. Sure. Thanks, guys. Our pleasure. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at ReviewThePodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, TheKnifeJunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at TheKnifeJunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, Email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487. And you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.